and welcome to this week's Digital CXO Podcast. I'm Amanda Rosani, and with me today is Mike Vizard. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Doing well. We have some great information to cover this week in the world of digital transformation, starting with an interview you had with, is it Tushar Patel of Clio and his advice as far as supply chains and keeping them from being disrupted. Can you go into some details? Yeah, I mean, his point of view on it is that they're going to get disrupted. There's no two ways about it. I mean, you can't help but explain, um, you know, there's going to be a cargo ship that in, in suddenly is out of control and hits a bridge in Baltimore. Who can plan for that? Nobody. Um, there's going to be disruptions with, you know, rebels trying to force uh, the sinking of ships in the Red Sea and that reroutes traffic around Africa. Who can foresee that? Nobody. There's just always going to be these kinds of disruptions and it's a fact of life. And, um, you know, if your supply chain gets disrupted, well, the point of this whole thing is that it shouldn't be disrupted because of these events. It's just something, you know, you have a single point of failure in your system that should not ex exist in the first place. So I think a lot of the digital CXOs need to kind of sit down with some of those supply chain executives and play out some what if scenarios and just say, well, if this piece was removed, I guess, you know, in the land of uh, uh, DevOps, we have a thing called chaos engineering, where we just randomly pull things out to see if the system crashes or not. Well, supply chains are the same idea. It's you've got to randomly just say, hey, what if we woke up tomorrow and this supplier was unavailable or it took us six weeks longer to get at some part, what would it do to the business? And I think shareholders are going to hold these companies more accountable for that because they're not going to be like, oh, geez, there was a disruption. Heavens to Betsy, you know, who knew? And then they're just going to punish your stock anyway and blame you anyway. So you might as well get in front of it. Yeah. And I think all the business leaders have learned a little bit, you would think, from a couple of years ago with that massive supply chain disruption that was all over the news and affected so many um, industries, especially automotive and such. And now we, we look at that with chips even. And uh, we know that even one little bottleneck in the supply chain there with computer chips can cause issues. So there does need to be some planning for these. Yeah. Now, I'll be a little bit cynical, right? Because, you know... Uh, We'll take gasoline prices, right? So, you know, if it's if somebody sneezes in Saudi Arabia, suddenly gas prices are up. And, I, and I'm being facetious, but the truth of the matter is there's a lot of folks out there who are using, you know, isolated incidents that probably don't have much of an impact to make a case for increasing some price on some good somewhere. And um, so people are going to be a little bit more... Uh, uh, critical of those moves because they're going to be like, well, that's nonsense because you're supposed to have a better plan in place in the, to make sure that that doesn't happen in the first place. So I was just recently at the Informatica conference in Las Vegas, uh, and we talked about this a little bit last week. So we're going to go more detailed about the interview that I had with Jim Kruger, as well as some other um, staff and reps that were with the company there. And the big thing in digital transformation right now, as we all know, is AI. It's a big thing company leaders are looking at, how to integrate it. And they have a new solution integrating the Claire, which is their generative AI solution, into all their um, data management tools. It's embedded into their intelligent data management cloud. And not to mention, there was a lot of talk about partnerships. They've partnered with Microsoft, AWS, Snowflake, amongst others, which I'm hearing a lot about, um, you know, the importance of partnerships when it comes to solutions. If they don't have a solution, then these partners do, and they can integrate their solutions to make a, a big product offering. So what did you hear about um, this? And what are your thoughts from business leaders? Well, Informatic has been at this Claire thing for a while. They were one of the earlier pioneers in that space, and it was much more around traditional machine learning models applied to data management. Now they're adding in the generative AI capability, and it seems like uh, Claire has expanded to be more of a, a brand than a particular thing. It's There's a bunch of models that sit behind that that you're going to be able to leverage for data management. Competition in this space, though, is fierce. 
everybody and his brother who has a data management platform is pointing the AI and saying, ooh, this is going to be a great thing and everybody has to get their data management house in order and maybe a flood will lift all boats. But it does seem to me there's just no end of options in this space. So I don't know if all of them are going to survive over time. Informatic has been around forever, but um, yeah, there's a lot of new players in this space too. So it'll be interesting to see how this all plays out. Yeah, and I think, again, the the partnerships and the collaboration with other companies, we're just going to see more of that as far as, you know, you're talking about one of them winning over another or fizzling out. But I think the more partnerships we see, uh, we're going to have combined tools available. Yeah, I would agree with that. And um, I think a lot of folks are also going to stitch a lot of different tools together. I'm not entirely clear how many folks are going to standardize on a single platform. I'm sure they would like to, but... Um, whether that's practical, it remains to be seen given all the data types that we're trying to now feed into these AI models. Yep, absolutely. Moving on, your brother Frank was just in Barcelona for the IoT World Congress event, and he wrote an article over on Digital CXO about combining forces with AI and Internet of Things, essentially bringing together information technology and operations technology and blending them. And uh, it's a it's a uh, seems to be something that business leaders are definitely looking into harnessing. Uh, but it's kind of on the beginning that really at the beginning stages of how to do that. So what are your thoughts? Well, it seems to me that the operationals technology people, otherwise known as OT, have discovered AI and it's, it's still early days, but uh, their understanding is that they're going to be able to take uh, some sort of inference engine that's small and run it on uh, an edge device to add some sort of uh, AI capabilities. Some of it might be predictive. Some of it might be generative. <laughs> Depends on the use case. Um, I think what will happen is uh, the compute horsepower at the edge is getting stronger and more robust with each passing day some of those things out there feel like you know and we used to call an entire server in a data center and they have that kind of capability it's still early in terms of am i going to use uh traditional cpus or am i going to use some sort of accelerator or, or am i going to you know maybe spring for a gpu if i can find one um there's just a whole spectrum of conversation to be had here. And the part that I'm scratching my head is, I mean, you know, with all due respect to OT people, they're not the most uh, compute software literate crowd in the world. They they understand the hardware easily enough. And uh, But these are a whole other generation of applications. And it's going to take a bunch of data scientists working with a bunch of developers. And then these things got to be centrally managed. So... I can't help but wonder if this becomes the uh, the fulcrum where this whole conversation about the merger of OT and IT finally happens because, you know, well, we've been talking about that for the better part of a decade, but the OT people have always been like, yeah, no, we're not so sure you IT guys know what you're doing, but we could use your help with cybersecurity. And that was it, full stop. Yeah, and I think it just involves uh, better communication and collaboration between these departments, maybe a little bit of training might be necessary when it comes to blending the two, but I think they could work together very har harmoniously um, and it would be a, a good way to tackle many processes. Well, watch this space. It's going to be interesting for certain. And I think, you know, when I was talking to Frank about it, he was talking about, uh, I guess there was folks who were using, uh, uh, well, they were tracking trains in Africa and they were using drones to do that. So anytime there was a disruption in the train service, the first thing they did is they flew a drone out there to see what was going on. Uh, sometimes, I guess, when there's an issue with theft from the trains as well, and I guess the minute the bad guys see the drone, they start heading for the hills. So I don't know, maybe you know, drones will be following along on uh, guard duty for trains, but it's an interesting... Yeah. And we're, and we're seeing drones being utilized as a resource more often, too, in those areas that people just can't get to or can't get to quickly enough. So it's a, it's a great solution. And there'll be embedded models in the drones talking to embedded AI models on the train. So it's mm -hmm. fun. Absolutely. So next, we have a, a, a contributed article. 
And this is actually on TechStrong AI. And it's about manufacturing industry and um, AI co-pilots helping the workers in manufacturing. And, and we're hearing a lot more about this too, speeding up processes, automating processes. And um, what are you hearing out there from business leaders? Well, a lot of those IoT systems that we were just talking about are on that manufacturing floor. Um, I believe there's already a significant amount of uh, predictive models used in manufacturing. So we'll see how generative AI gets um, added to that mix. But you can envision a world where, um, you know, tell me where it's most likely we're going to have a disruption in our service, you know, as a combination of a predictive and generative AI uh, question, because the response will come back in natural language versus, you know, some fancy chart that's a little hard to decipher. So I guess what I think is going to happen is we're going to see these models kind of work in concert with each other and we'll and have some orchestration layers and different tasks will be handled by different AI models. And maybe we need an orchestrator for the AI models to help us with the manufacturing process. But um, it's going to be uh, interesting, challenging times and but I also think one of the places that maybe for use cases for AI that we get the biggest return on investment immediately is manufacturing because it's generally more of a contained kind of thing, right? I mean, uh, I have a limited amount of data, uh, or at least I have a well-defined set of data that I can apply to the AI models in a way that I can um, guarantee at least the better output. So it's not like everything's general purpose. So to a certain degree, I can keep things, uh, at least the outputs from the Gen AI response will hopefully uh, hallucinate less because, well, I can't afford to hallucinate in manufacturing because, well, who knows? Maybe you're making yogurt and suddenly you got a thousand gallons of extra yogurt because some AI model hallucinated. That's a no-go. Yeah. And what I envision as, as being really awesome is if we could have ways to where we could literally just kind of speak out loud to some sort of system and the AI is going to just um, respond and we tell it what to do and it, and it talks to the machinery and everything gets on track. That'd be really cool and efficient. I think we're a little far from that right now, but it'd be pretty cool if we could just talk to something. It talks to the machine and it gets done. That's just get her done. That'll be the model for AI. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so last on our list, let's see here. Yes, so this is a very interesting contributed article on Digital CX, though. And it's about this big four consulting firm layoff um, and how that really kind of shows the industry shift for digital transformation. And the interesting thing is that they didn't foresee it. And so they had all these layoffs as business leaders were cutting costs and they were cutting their consulting firm um, costs and going more with accounting and things that made more sense um, for the return on investment um, as they moved to digitally transform. So it was an article about tips for digital transformation in general, and then um, how you could look at NVIDIA's innovation and uh, their digital transformation process and how they have just excelled and how other company leaders could do the same, uh, as well as why did the consulting firms themselves who are helping these companies, why did they not foresee it and um, have such struggle? Mm -hmm. So very interesting article. What are your thoughts? Well, I think that there's was a massive amount of investment and headcount from these companies, um, you know, in the COVID era, because everybody thought everything was going to be digitally transformed. And a lot of these projects were, shall we say, ambitious. And, you know, come to today and pretty clear that the emphasis has shifted to, you know, help us be more efficient and give us some sort of tangible ROI. And I think that caught a lot of the uh, shall we say, uh, big thinkers in some of these companies off base. And yeah, so I'd be curious to see, you know, who exactly is being laid off in these organizations, because I think it's twofold, right? I think one is the, you know, the long-term fanciful thinker in those projects are probably harder to fund. And then I also think that the uh, services companies themselves are looking at Gen AI and saying, there's a lot of things here that maybe we're in front of a little bit still, but maybe we'll cut some headcount now to make the bottom line look better in anticipation of the fact that we think AI is going to do more of those things for us. And so maybe we can cut from 
uh, the bottom. So I feel like the cut scheme at you know the super high end of the service providers and then the more manual, tedious kind of jobs that they're hoping AI will do for them. Uh, theoretically, they have a bunch of consultants that can go execute some of that, but who knows? I think a lot of folks are still, you know, the jury is still out on exactly what I can do with AI and cannot do with AI with or without people. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that brings us to the end of our list this week. And I want to ask you, the audience, to share what are your thoughts on what we share each week? Which articles are your favorite? What do you like reading about? So feel free to put that in the comments. And meanwhile, have a wonderful week. And Mike, what are your last thoughts? All right, everybody. There's a lot going on with AI. Don't let it intimidate you. Keep going forward, but keep those expectations reasonable at the same time. Absolutely. Okay, well, have a great day, everyone. Till next week. 